Okay, so yeah, let's start with this example. Um, so, given is this function, and uh, we are looking for roots of these functions. And the root is a point x for which f of x is equal to zero. Uh? And now, I mean, if you look at this function and you set it equal to zero, then uh, you get the equation x squared over 4 is equal to the sine of x. Yeah? Um, and that's what we can see here in this uh, graph. This is the sine and this is the parabola. And there is this intersection here and this intersection here. Um, of course, there is this obvious solution x equals 0. And then there is this second solution which we don't know exactly. Well, and uh, I mean, it's a good idea when you do mathematics um, before you start computing to get a rough estimate about the set of solutions. Here you see we already know there are two solutions. One of them we know exactly and the second solution we know it approximately because we know the sign here at pi half the sign is 1 and the parabola of course is uh, uh, below 1 and here for x equal 2 for x equal 2 the left hand side is equal to 1 uh, and the sign is uh, smaller than 1 that's what you see here so this intersection must be in this interval between pi half and 2. Yeah. I mean, that's good to, first of all, to check the solution we get, whether it's correct. And secondly, which is for most of the algorithms we will see important, to have a starting value. Uh, so then we could here use as a starting value 2 or pi half, which is not too far from the solution. Okay, and uh, I mean, we can get an even better approximation uh, of the solution by starting with such a table. And then uh, we see uh, for x equal 1.6, um, our f of x is uh, below, below 0 for 1.82, but for 2 it's greater than 0. So between 1.8 and 2, there must be a solution. Huh? Okay, yeah. Okay, and, and I mean this here says if f is continuous and um, there is an interval a, b such that f of a times f of b is uh, is negative, then f has a root in the interval. Why is this the, the, uh, the case? If this product is negative, then either one f of a or f of b has to be ne negative and the other one positive. Huh? And that means, I mean, the picture looks like that. a, b, um, and then maybe f is positive here and negative here and there must be at least one root in the interval. So this is one possibility but the picture may look like that. That's also possible and then we have many roots in the interval. Okay. Um, yes, and um, one method that, uh, I mean, improves what we did here, I mean, that, that was just more or less randomly testing the sign of our function. 
But now, once you have this interval, 1.8 and 2.0, then what would you do next? You would take the center of this interval and uh, test the sign of the function at this center and then see whether it's negative and po or positive. Then you have a new interval. Uh, and the width of the new interval is exactly half the width of the interval before. And that's what we call the interval bisection method. Uh, sorry for this uh, uh, not so nice heading here. Um, yeah, and here in, in this uh, little figure you can see this interval bisection method, yes. So we have this, uh, we start here with the left um, boundary of our interval and here the right. And then we take the middle of the interval and depending on whether the function value is negative, if it's negative, then we put the, uh, the left margin here um, and then we take the middle again. Now if, as it is here, the function value is positive, then we will, will uh, move the right margin to this point and iteratively we uh, take the middle of the interval and continue this. Uh, that's a very easy method. Um, it converges to a root of the function, which is very important and very nice, but only if the function is continuous. Yeah. Why is it necessary for the function to be continuous? Oh no, let me ask differently. Can you give me a counterexample? Can you give me a, f um, a function which is not continuous and where this um, method fails? Okay, yeah, 1 over x. And yes, so what is your counterexample? Yeah, we don't have an intersection with the x axis. Okay, so there is, yeah, th this is a function which has no root. Huh? I mean, I would say it's not surprising uh, that if we have a function with no root, that we don't find a root. <laughs> but let me tell you something surprising, maybe. If you do the bisection with this function, and you start with the interval minus 1, 1, or minus 2, 2, it doesn't matter, it will converge. It will converge. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you take an asymmetric interval, it will not converge because in the first step, the middle of the interval, there the function is not defined. And that's not good if a function is not defined. Huh? But if you use an asymmetric interval like minus 1 plus 2, the function will converge. But what does that mean? First question is, where will it converge to? And second, what is that where it converges to? But that's, that's uh, an exercise. It's not this function, it's a different function. But in the exercise you will see what happens, what may happen when you apply this bisection method to functions which are not continuous. It may work, but um, it won't find a root. Okay, so I, of course we can write this as a little piece of pseudocode which we have here, we don't look into this. Then there is this theorem. Um, 
you see, f needs to be continuous and the sign must change in the interval. Um, and if these assumptions hold, then the interval bisection method converges to a root of our function f. And even more, after n steps, this root is determined with a precision of b minus a divided by 2 power n. Now, um, I'm actually not going to show you the proof of this theorem. But, I would like to hear from you about this precision boundary. This is an upper bound for the accuracy of the solution. Um, and it's, it's really easy to understand this upper bound. Let's look at the following table. N is the, the, the number of iterations. And uh, then here, we give the interval. For n equals 0 at the beginning, we start on the interval AB. Or, no, interval width. Here we give the interval width. What is the width? B minus A is the interval uh, at the beginning. Now after the first iteration step, what's the width of our interval? B minus A half. After the second? Half of B minus A by half. Half of B minus A by half. Yeah. So let's write it like B minus A over 4. Yeah? Um, okay, and after, um, what did we have? N steps, yeah. What is it then? B minus A by 2 power. Yeah. Okay, and that's what we have over there. Okay, yes. Um, Let's look into this definition, even though we don't need it because we don't prove this theorem. But we will today prove another theorem where we need the definition of a Cauchy sequence. So, I mean, we looked at this when we um, repeated uh, the chapter on series from analysis. I hope you remember this was a few weeks ago. Huh? A sequence, a n is called a so uh, Cauchy sequence. If for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists an n from the real numbers such that for all n and m uh, greater than or equal to this capital N, a m minus a n absolutely is smaller than epsilon. You have this picture still in mind about Cauchy sequences? I hope so. What is the advantage? I mean, normally when we want to prove that some method converges to a limit, we could use the definition of convergence, which is quite similar to this. Yeah? Let me write the definition of convergence. Um, that's the definition of convergence. Convergence. What's the difference between these two? Yeah? Uh, in the normal definition, we don't know the a, the limit a. 
in the normal, what is the normal definition? This one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the point. I would say in the normal, de in order to use or apply the normal definition, we have to know uh, the, the limit A. Uh, but uh, whenever we do not know the limit A, we cannot apply this definition. And that's why we need a uh, Cauchy sequence. And what's very important, and you see it here, that's why we can apply this Cauchy criterion. Because in the real numbers, every Cauchy sequence converges. So every Cauchy sequence has a limit in the real numbers. Okay, we will need this for the Banach fixed point theorem later. We do not prove this. It's not, it's not a difficult proof. Um, and um, I would appreciate if you look at it at some time. Okay, yes. Um, and now, um, a few notes. One interesting note is, or a, a question is, if we do this interval bisection, how many digits do I gain per iteration step? Or how many iteration steps do I need to get one more digit in precision? Yeah. That's a question we ask all the time in numerics. How many iterations do we need to get one more digit in precision? And here it is 3.3 .3 steps do we need. Why? Because, look, 2 to the power uh, n, that's what we have in the denominator here. Uh? So the precision um, or the, the interval width decreases proportional to 2 to the power minus n. And now which n do I need here to get 10 to the power minus 1, which is one digit? It is 3.3. Okay. <coughs> um, yeah, that doesn't look too bad. So in order to get a precision of 10 digits, we would need uh, 33 steps, which is not too bad. Huh? But there are methods for finding roots which are much, much faster. Huh? So compared to these other methods, like the Newton's method, we will see uh, this is quite slow. And why is it slow? And the answer is here, because this method only exploits the sign of the function, nothing else. Yeah? The only information we use during the iteration is, is the sign of the function in the middle of the interval positive or negative? We don't use the information about the function value. How far am I away from the, from the axis? Um, that's what I don't use. So we don't use the function value. And also we don't use the first derivative or the second derivative. The first derivative, of course, tells us how fast does it go towards the root. Okay, so that's the bad news. But the good news is the interval bisection method is um, a very stable method. I mean, it can be applied all the time, even, um, or not even, uh, the only assumption is the function has to be continuous. That's all we need as a requirement. Um, and other methods, they do have strong requirements on uh, differentiability and maybe even uh, derivatives of higher order. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and also for the computer science students, it may be interesting to see the relation between the interval bisection method and uh, bisection search. Yeah? Bisection search is a search algorithm you can apply on files to find 
um, entries. Yeah? To find elements in a file, maybe you have a text file and then you, you can search for a word in the text file, but only under some assumption. What is the assumption? It is a sorted file. Yes, the file must be sorted. I was expecting somebody to say the file has to be continuous. Huh? <laughs> but files in computer science, they are never continuous because we live in a discrete world. Huh? And in discrete worlds, the notion of continuity doesn't make sense. Huh? Okay, but in this discrete world, we do have this bisection search. I mean, bisection search is whenever you look up a phone number in a, in a phone dictionary, in a book, in a written phone dictionary book. And if it's thick like that, what, if you look for some phone number, you just open it anywhere and then you see, I'm, I'm looking for a Huber and then I open it and I see, oh, there's the M here, then I know it's in the left uh, uh, half and then I open it in the middle and I see uh, F and then I know it's in the right half and so on. So it's exactly what we do in, in bisection search. Huh? Um, but the difference is, in this discrete world of computer science, the bisection search is the best search algorithm we can find for arbitrary sorted files. Huh? And here, it's among the worst algorithms. And what's the reason? Yeah, the reason is the, the discreteness of computer science. We cannot talk about first and second derivatives. Nothing like that is defined. Um, and therefore, we cannot ex exploit such information. But in mathematics, if a function is differentiable, then we may exploit the first derivative and may find a better algorithm that leads us to this route much faster. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, let's uh, go to the next algorithm, which is fixed point iteration. Um, and here we will see that, I mean, this is a very nice algorithm. Um, and we will see under which conditions we have slow convergence or fast convergence or even extremely fast convergence. Yeah? Um, okay, but. Uh, let's look at the definition of a fixed point. Look, what we have here, this is a so-called fixed point equation. Uh? Um, and um, a fixed point of such an equation, x is equal to f of x, All numbers x that fulfill this equation are called fixed points of the function f. Why are they called fixed points? I think I already told you this somewhere at the beginning of this semester. Yeah, we gave such an example, okay. But uh, my question now was, why are these solutions called fixed points? No matter from where we start, it converges to the same point. No. I mean, that may be true, but that's, that's not the reason why they are called fixed points. They converge always to the same point. No, that's the same answer that he gave. I mean, if I hammer a nail into the wall here, the nail is a fixed point on the wall, okay? Why do we call this a fixed point on the wall, this nail? Because it is fixed. Because it's fixed to the wall. It doesn't move around. Huh? And why are these axes fixed points? Because they are fixed. Because they don't move around. Why don't they move around? 
What does that mean? We call it a fixed point of the function f. Huh? Why? Because if I apply the function f to such a fixed point x, the function f won't change this fixed point. The result is x again. So, um, for example, it may be if 5 is a fixed point, then f of 5 is equal to 5. So 5 is fixed under the application of f. And uh, we, can, we can talk about fixed points of functions from the real numbers to the real numbers. That's the easiest thing. But we can talk about fixed points in any circumstances. For example, excuse me, in, in artificial intelligence, in reinforcement learning, there are many algorithms um, for reinforcement learning and typically, uh, no, some, so, uh, some classes of these algorithms are fixed point, um, fixed point uh, um, equations, even though we are not in the real numbers. And, uh, yeah. And we can do this on matrices and, um, yeah. Okay. And now we can, uh, we can iteratively try to find a solution. That's what we also talked about. We had this <coughs> example of, we tried to find a square root, I guess. Yeah? And, oh, and actually it was not a sine, it was the cosine, I guess. I'm pretty sure it was the cosine I used as an example. Because with the sine it's not so nice, huh? but with the cosine it's nice. Yeah, I gave the example, you take your pocket calculator and um, just hit the cosine key all the time, very often. And you will finally see that it converges. Huh? And where does it converge to? Hopefully to a fixed point. Huh? And that's all we will, we will uh, look at now. Huh? So there are some questions. First, we have given a fixed point equation. And second, we, we do this fixed point iteration. We start with some initial value and then we'll hit our key, our function key, often. And now there are two questions. First question is, does this iteration converge? Second question, if it converges, does it converge to a fixed point or maybe it converges to something else? That's what we will look at. And now we can um, visualize this whole uh, process graphically. Um, let's first look at this diagram. Here we have this function and we do have this diagonal, um, so the, the identity x. Look, this is the left hand side. This is x, this is the left hand side, it's the diagonal. This is the right hand side, our function f. So the fixed points are the intersections between this diagonal and the function. And you see there is this intersection. Huh? And now we start our fixed point iteration. What does that mean? We take some value x0, maybe not too far from the intersection, which is here, it's quite close to the intersection. And now what we do is we calculate f of x, f of x0. Um, yes, we take f of x0, this is the value. And now we take the mirror image of this f of x0. Maybe I should draw this. The mirror image of f of x0 is, it's exactly here. Yeah? So this is f of x0. And then we compute the function value again here. And it's this one. And then we take here this value. 
which is f of f of x0 and then we go here and compute this value and then mirror image is here this is f of f of f of x0 and I mean of course we can draw this we can do this whole thing easier um, we, we, we take the function value then we just go here and down here and so on that's our fixed point iteration but our news are bad it does not converge to the fixed point it does actually converge away from the fixed point we are walking in the wrong direction but we use our fixed point iteration okay but maybe we look at uh, another example let's look at this example and start with this x0 we go to the function then to the diagonal and so on and look here this looks nice doesn't it it converges towards this fixed point here but again we may ask why doesn't it converge to this fixed point because we started much closer to this one okay and now let's continue with this example here um, so here the function now I mean these two functions they are monotonically increasing this is monotonically decreasing and we start here with x0 and it goes like that and again it does not converge it diverges huh? and now the last example this one here is a good example again it converges again now what's the reason why in these two lower graphs it converges and here we have divergence what's the reason what's common in these two examples and in these two examples Aha. Uh -huh. So here it converges. And we start far away from the intersection. But okay, so let's start uh, here closer. And you would say it it would not converge. Okay, why don't we start Why don't we start here? So we get here of course it converges even faster so yeah this is a counter example to your hypothesis I'm sorry but maybe rather than looking at these two together and at these two maybe you should find the difference between these two and the difference between these two what's different isn't it quite similar function is monotonically decreasing here and here increasing here and here At x0, x is bigger than f of x. Uh huh. And here, not. Uh, 
look at the function. Look at the function. What's the difference between the function in the upper two examples and the function in the lower two examples? The slope is increasing here and here and here. Here it's decreasing, you're right. Why don't you look at, uh, at the first derivative? I mean, you were talking about the second derivative. Increasing of the slope is the second derivative. How about the first derivative? Okay, let me give you the simple answer. The answer is that at the intersection, at the fixed point here, the slope of f is smaller than 1. And here it's negative, but the absolute value still is smaller than 1. But here, the absolute value is bigger than 1, and here too. That's the point. And we will prove this. We will prove that fixed point iteration converges if the absolute value of the slope in the interval is smaller than 1. Okay, but now let's uh, look at this. Yes, and this fixed point iteration is quite a nice method because it even works if the function is not differentiable. Look, we just talked about the slope of the function. We can only talk about the slope of a function if the function is differentiable. Yeah? Um, but now, if the function is not differentiable, we cannot talk about the slope. But there is a kind of a generalization of the slope. Um, and that's what we define here in this definition. Um, we are talking about contracting functions and that are functions where the, the absolute value of the slope is smaller than 1 even if they are not differentiable yeah? and that's why we need a new definition. We call a function f from an interval a, b onto the same interval a, b. That's very important. Uh, you will need this. You will need this property in the future. Uh, don't forget it. Uh, such a function is called a contraction on the interval a, b if there is a Lipschitz constant, capital L, between 0 and 1. And here it's important that L is strictly between uh, these two. So the, the margins are not allowed. Uh, if such a Lipschitz constant exists, with, uh, and this inequality holds for all x and y in the interval. Very important, for all x and y in the interval. Now what is this, what is this here? Let me draw a picture. Okay. Now, let's first uh, draw um, a square. And because this is a square, I have A here again and B here again. You see, that our function f must map the interval AB onto the interval AB. So the region which is relevant is exactly this square. And everything outside is not interesting for us. Okay, and now let's look at this inequality. Let's take two arbitrary points x 
and y in this interval. And of course, we, we need to take uh, some function. Um, OK. And now we have here f of x. And here f of y. Um, now let's let's re rewrite this inequality f of x minus f of y divided by x minus y and the absolute value. And this must be less than or equal to this L. And remember, L is a number between 0 and 1. In particular, L has to be smaller than 1. So that means if L is smaller than 1, that means um, the enumerator is smaller than the denominator. And this means this is shorter than this. Okay? Or in other words, we can, we can draw this triangle here. In German it's called Steigungsdreieck. What's that in English? Steigungsdreieck. Okay, so let's call it Steigungsdreieck. And uh, this is x minus y, absolutely, and this is f of x minus f of y. And now you see the slope of this straight line here. That's the ratio of these two guys. So this ratio is the slope of the straight line here in the Steigungsdreieck. And so you see, this is related to, to the, the slope of the function. But what's unfortunate is that, I mean, that, that doesn't tell us too much about the slope of the function. For example, here, the slope may be much steeper than what we get here. This is, I mean, what we get from this large triangle is the average slope of the function in this interval. But that's actually not what we are interested in. What we want to know in the following is the maximum of the slope of the function. Why? Because we have seen whenever the slope is, the function is too steep, we may get problems when we do fixed point iteration. But what, what you might have overseen still is this here, for all x and y in the interval. For all x and all y in the interval. And so if this holds for all x and y, then we may take such an interval, a new x here and a new y here, <laughs> and then you see this is much closer to the real slope of f here in this region. So if this has to hold for all x and y, in particular for x and y which are very close together, then this approximates the first derivative of f very well. But, I mean, the good thing is this contraction, contraction property uh, can be applied to arbitrary functions. Yeah, there is no 
uh, precondition that the function has to be uh, differentiable or whatever? No. Okay, this is the definition of contraction. And we will, so, we will show in a few minutes that every contracting function has a fixed point and the iteration converges. <coughs> yeah, in a few minutes. But now let's look at this lemma, which is a very nice property about contracting functions. This lemma tells us if our f is differentiable, um, then f is a contraction on our interval with a Lipschitz constant of L if and only if the absolute value of the first derivative is less than or equal to the Lipschitz constant. Yeah? So that means whenever your function is differentiable, you don't hurry, have to worry about this weird definition here. Then it's sufficient to look at the first derivative of f. Huh? But there may be functions which are not differentiable. And then you have to use the contraction condition. OK, yeah, let's, let's do, um, let's say, half of the proof of this little lemma. What is the idea for the proof for both directions? The idea is, of course, what we have here. Oh, yeah, that's... In, in German it's called the Differenzenquotient. That might be in English the difference ratio. Huh? That's the difference ratio. And now let's write down the definition of, uh, di of a function to be differentiable. Um, f is differentiable in x if um, the limit for, um, yeah, y towards x, but y not equal to x, f of x minus f of y divided by um, x minus y exists. Oh, uh, yeah, and uh, of course, we give this a name, this limit. The name of this limit is f prime of x. That's the definition of the first derivative of a function f, okay? And now you see the similarity to what we have up here. And, uh, okay, yeah. So the, 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 this little proof up there says if a function is a contraction, then, um, and f is differentiable, then we can use the first derivative. Now look, if f is a contraction, then we have this here. Huh? And this ratio is less than or equal to this upper bound L, which is smaller than 1. And now what we do at the ne in the next step is we take the limit for x towards y, or for y, no, let's, let's do uh, y towards x.
What's very important again here is this for all x and y in the interval. For all x and y. So if this holds for all x and y, then it holds especially if x and y are very close together. Huh? So then we can, we can really let this y approach x um, as long as y is not equal to x because then the denominator would be zero. Huh? Okay, um, and now we have to be careful. We are now talking about the limit. We are not talking about any, uh, anymore about any x and y, we are talking about the limit. But because our function f is continuous, we can do this, we can really uh, um, do this limit process. Yeah? And then for the limit, this will hold again. And what is the limit of this? The limit is the absolute value of the first derivative, the absolute value because of this. Yeah? The limit is the absolute value. So this holds for the absolute value of the first derivative and we're finished. Okay, yeah. But I mean the other direction is not really much more difficult. It's kind of uh, the other way around. Okay, yeah, we go back to this example uh, from the square root calculation. I mean, there we, maybe you remember that, what did we do? We started with this equation, x squared equal to a. And now the solution, the positive solution, x1 is square root of a. Huh? Um, and what we did is we used this equation and made some equivalent transformations and finally we ended up with this function. Uh, yeah, we ended up with x is equal to one half x plus a over x. Okay, and this right hand side is our function f and it has to be equal to x, so this is f this is the diagonal x and this is our fixed point which is square root of a and here maybe a may be 2. Yeah. yeah. And now we can uh, Oh no, we didn't. We, we did do this already. We can apply fixed point iteration and it, will, it works here. But now, um, before we do fixed point iteration, we want to check this contraction condition or this lemma. So we want to check whether this function, this function here, is con um, contracting. Is this function a contraction? We know that this function is differentiable. Wherever it is defined, it is differentiable. I mean, that's easy to see. And because it's differentiable, we can apply this lemma. In order to apply this lemma, we have to show that the first derivative of x is absolutely smaller than 1. And, and even more we have to prove, we have to find such a, a Lipschitz constant L which is smaller than 1. Okay, yeah, so what do we do? We compute the first derivative which we have here and then we look, um, oh yes, and, uh, and we know, I mean we see that this first derivative is negative whenever this right hand side is uh, positive. Huh? Whenever this here is positive, 
Uh, no, no, sorry. Whenever this is greater than one half, then the first derivative is negative. Huh? And when is this greater than one half? Yeah, as soon as this is close to, close enough to zero. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, we also see this in the picture. Here we have a strong negative first derivative. And somewhere here it becomes zero, and then we have a positive derivative. Um, what we immediately see when we look at this function is that for x towards infinity, um, this term approaches zero. So in the limit for x towards infinity, this function approaches one half x, which is such a, um, a line. Huh? So you see, this function is contracting between this intersection and infinity. It's contracting everywhere to the right from here. But here it may be critical. Here it may become critical because the slope goes to infinity. So the question is how far to the left can we go in order for the function to be contracting? That's the question. And so that's why we, why we are looking for a point x such that f prime of x is greater than minus 1. Because, I mean, minus 1 is maybe here, so we are looking for, for such an area. Okay, and we solve this equation greater than minus 1, and we get as a result x greater than square root of a third. And for a equal 2, we get this, which is 0 0.817. Yeah? Okay, and I mean, if I go a little bit further to the right, so maybe square root of a third plus some epsilon, um, this is the left margin of the interval, and this goes to, uh, up to infinity. On such an interval, f is contracting. And now, because we know f is contracting in the interval, we might do fixed point iteration now. Yeah. Why we use the minus one? Could we take minus 2 or minus 3 also? No. No. No, no, no. Look here. This Lipschitz constant must be smaller than 1. But uh, greater than 0. Oh, I see. OK. You wonder why we talk about minus 1 and not about plus 1. Yeah? Because if f prime of x is greater than minus 1 and smaller than 0, okay, then if I take the absolute value of f prime, this is less than 1 and greater than 0. I mean, that was because we knew already that the first derivative of f is negative. We know that it is negative, and so uh, if this negative first derivative is in this interval, it's contracting. Okay, and here we have this central theorem, which is the Banach fixed point theorem. Huh? Uh, I mean, that's one of the most important theorems in, the, in all of numerical mathematics. Okay, so the condition is F has to be a contraction. And this is the only assumption we need, that's all. We only have to know F is a contraction. And then we have uh, three properties. First is f has exactly one fixed point s in the interval. Isn't that surprising? Isn't that, couldn't we call this a fixed point production theorem? 
even if our function has no fixed point, we apply Banach's fixed point theorem and then it has one. Isn't that nice? So that's like, that's like making functions pregnant. So you may take a virgin function, apply Banach's fixed point theorem, and then it's pregnant uh, with a fixed point. Yeah? <laughs> I mean, the question is whether this function girl was pregnant already. Now that's my, qu my question to you. Was she already pregnant or not? I mean, does the Banach fixed point theorem uh, produce fixed points? No, of course not. The fixed point was there before. But the, the interesting question is, our Banach fixed point theorem does not require a fixed point to be there. How does it come, where does it come from? Or does it? Maybe we should reformulate the first uh, proposition and say whenever a function is contracting on a closed interval AB then this function has a fixed point in the interval. That's proposition number one. Huh? Every contracting function has a fixed point. Oh, and even more. So there are no twin fixed points. Huh? There are twin babies, but no twin fixed points. Huh? They always come as singles. There is exactly one fixed point. What is the intuition behind this? Let me show you. Let's go into this picture again. There is this square, A, B. And there is this uh, straight line X. And now how does a contracting function look like? I mean, it may look like that. And then we have our fixed point. Or it may look like... Um, that. And we have our fixed point. And it may look like... That. And we have three fixed points. No. There are no twin fixed points and no triple fixed points. 
This is not allowed. Why is this not allowed? Yes. That's it. The slope is greater than 1 here in this area. And that's not allowed. And you see, as soon as we forbid slopes greater than 1, then we have to erase it in this area. I mean, we can continue with the slope slower than 1. And that's it. And you won't find a function with a slope that's absolutely smaller than 1 and with more than one fixed point. And also you won't find such a function with no fixed point. But be careful and never forget that this is a square. As soon as you forget that this is a square, then of course I can draw functions with large slopes which have no fixed point. They are this function is defined on the interval AB, but it's not inside this square. A function mapping from the interval AB on the interval AB. Okay. So, and now, but now comes the interesting part. Um, for any initial value in the interval, the fixed point duration converges to this unique fixed point S. And uh, number three, the cutoff error can be estimated by this equation. So we don't look at it uh, in detail now at this equation. Um, but what's important is it's a cutoff error. So we can get an, a bound for the error similarly as we had it in, with the interval bisection. We also had an error bound b minus a uh, over 2 power n. But let's look at these special cases. So this is the general equation. And now we take a special case, L equals zero in this inequality. Look, L power K minus L. And so this L equals zero gives L power K. Um, and then uh, we get X1, X1 minus X zero here. And that's why we call this uh, inequality the a priori estimation. Huh? Why a priori estimation? Because on the left-hand side, we have the distance of our value xk after k iteration steps, the distance from the fixed point. That's what we want to know. And this distance to the fixed point is bounded above by this term. And what we have here is um, the difference between the first two iterations. Um, yes. And that's why we call this an a priori estimation. Because we can, in the beginning of the iteration, maybe we do 100 iteration steps, but after step number one, we can already uh, we will know how close we will be to the fixed point after 100 iterations. Isn't that nice? When we start doing the computation, after one, after one step, we already know how close we are to the goal after 100 steps. That's really nice. Yeah? And that's why we call this an a priori estimation. I always compare this a priori estimation to what happened when my kids were small. When we um, went on vacation, typically we drove there by car and it took us hours. And uh, I mean, our kids, they were not so patient. Huh? 
So when we, when we left Ravensburg, uh, maybe one kilometer after Ravensburg, the first of my kids asked, Papa, will I go to Daddy, how long does it take uh, to the goal, maybe in Italy? Yeah? Um, and uh, my answer typically was, I don't know. <laughs> because we don't know whether there is a traffic jam at the fen a fender tunnel or wherever. No? Um, but then they said, uh, Papa, I will see it aber wissen. And then I gave an a priori estimation. And then I said, maybe at most it takes us 10 hours. I knew it will be only three hours, but in order to be on the safe side, I said 10 hours. No? That's an a priori estimation. The point is with the a priori estimation, when they ask you immediately after the start, I can't tell them exactly on one second when we will be there. So I have to make a rough estimate. But then, I mean, they were asking me all the time, every five minutes, Baba will and God know. Um, and finally, five minutes before we reach the goal, when I already see uh, maybe the ocean or whatever where we drove to, then I could tell them, oh, we will be there in five minutes. So the estimation then is much more exact. And that's what we call the a posteriori estimation. Look, they asked me between kilometer 250 and 251. Huh? They ask me, how far are we away from our goal S? Yeah? So S, maybe S is the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, maybe. Yeah? How far are we from the sea? Yeah? So this point XK, how far is it from the goal? And this formula tells it. Yeah. And you see, what is the, 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 the important parameter? You know it already, it's L, our Lipschitz constant. The Lipschitz constant tells us how fast v uh, our iteration converges. So whether it may be it's only a bicycle or it's a Ferrari. Yeah? That's what our Lipschitz constant tells us. Yeah. Okay, and now let's look into the proof of this Banach fixed point theorem. Yeah, let's go back here. So we have to show that F has exactly one fixed point. We have to show that the duration converges and we have to prove this error bound. We will do number one and two and number three we will just omit here. I mean, it's quite similar to 1 and 2. And now, I mean, I show you this proof because it involves a very important principle and we will, we will need this in the following. For example, when we derive Newton's method, we will need this again. Um, yeah. Yes, let's do this on the blackboard. xk uh, minus xk, no, xk plus 1 minus xk. We start with this. So we have done maybe 100 iteration steps. And now we, um, we want to get back from this, di from this distance to x1 minus x0. 
How can we do this? We will first apply our fixed point uh, iteration. Xn plus 1 is equal to f of Xn. So this fixed point um, iteration procedure will now be iteratively applied here. So xk plus 1 is f of xk minus f of xk minus 1. Yeah? And now, look here we have it. Um, yeah, we have to de uh, remove the limit. This is our contraction property. Oh yes, and let's bring this to the right hand side. This is our uh, contraction property. And this property holds for all x and y, and because it holds for all x and y, it also holds for xk and xk minus 1. So we can now say this is less than or equal to L times xk plus 1 minus xk. Okay? I mean, these are two trivial steps. Huh? First, we apply our uh, fixed point iteration property, and second, we apply the uh, contraction property. Uh, and you see, we can only do this if our function is contracting. And, uh, yeah, what have we achieved now? Look, and that's nice. We come from this interval, xk plus 1 minus xk, down to, oh, sorry, Oh yeah, <laughs> we have we have achieved nothing actually. <laughs> so now now let's cheat a little bit. No, this is this is the truth, huh? Okay. Um, and now we continue, and this is equal to L times. And now we can uh, replace this as we did it here. We, now we repeat this, this step again. Huh? L times, we apply our fixed point iteration to this. F of xk minus 1 minus f of xk minus 2. And now the contraction again. This is less than or equal to L squared times xk minus 1 minus xk minus 2. Okay. And now we can repeat this um, until here we reach x1 minus x0. Okay, so now let's see. In the first step, we came from k minus k plus one to k and so on. So what we did from here to here was k steps. So we get, let's see. Oh yeah, yeah so we get l to the power k. Yeah. Okay, and over there on the slide it's a little bit different because we repeated the whole thing only to xl plus 1 minus xl and that's why here we have l uh, to the power k minus l. Yeah. And for l equals 0, that's what we get and what we had here too. Now, um, so what we see here is that um, the distance between two successive iterative uh, intermediate results, xk plus 1 minus xk, 
is getting smaller the further we get. And the factor that it reduces every, uh, in every step is the Lipschitz constant. So, yes, okay, yeah, so that's enough for the moment. I mean, this doesn't help us in, uh, it does help us, but we have not proven uh, anything of the theorem yet. But in the next step now, we will now prove that um, the sequence of our xk is a Cauchy sequence. Yeah? And what is a Cauchy, a Cauchy sequence? We have to prove that the distance between xm and xn um, is smaller than zero for large enough m. And that's what we do here. Look, what we do here is now we take xk plus m minus xk. Um, for an arbitrary k and arbitrary m. If this holds for arbitrary k and m, that's exactly the property of a Cauchy sequence. Yeah? So if this is smaller than any epsilon for k towards infinity, then this is a Cauchy sequence. And that's what we prove now. Now let's look. What, what do we do is we take this difference and that's what we do quite often in mathematics. We just push a zero in between these two guys. Look, here are they. This one and this one. And we just we, we push a number of zeros in between. We can do this all the time. So minus xk plus m minus 1 plus xk plus m minus 1. Uh, I mean, we take the next guy here with a minus and with a plus here and so on and so on up to here. And then uh, we get inside here a sum of all these differences. Uh, of all these differences from xk plus m down to xk. Yeah. i equal k to k plus m minus 1. OK, yeah. And what's not so nice is that the absolute value here is outside the sum because we want to have it here inside. But we can just take it inside the absolute value, but then we have to put a less than or equal here. Why? Which property did we apply here? Yeah? The absolute value of x plus y is not equal to uh, the absolute value of x plus y. Less than or equal to, yes, yes. Yeah, and, and what's the name of this uh, inequality? Triangular, Triangular inequality, yes. Yeah. Okay, so we can do this. Um, yes, and now on each one of these terms we now um, apply what we had here. Look, on, um, so if, if we have xk plus 1 mi minus xk, then we get L to the power k. And if we have xk plus m minus xk plus m minus 1, Let's, yeah, xk plus m is the biggest here. Then we get L to the power k plus m minus 1. And that's what we have here. Look, the first Lipschitz constant is L to the power k plus m minus 1. The next one is L to the power k plus m minus 2. And so on, down to L to the power k, which is for this last uh, or smallest uh, term in the sum. Uh, the smallest term in the sum is xk plus 1. For xk plus 1, we get L to the power k. That's what we have here, times x1 minus x0. So you see, what we have applied here is a couple of times 
this inequality. Okay, um, now you see there is this L to the power K times this sum here. Now look at this sum. This is a well-known sum. Where do, this, do you know this from? It's a finite geometric series. Huh? It's a finite geometric series with the, the, the factor L. Okay, so we apply the formula for the finite geometric series here. And that's what we have. And now let's look what happens with this term for k towards infinity. m is fixed. m is fixed now. So this is a constant. We have a fixed L. So this is a constant. This is a constant too. It does not depend on k. So we have a constant times L to the power k. And now here you see why this L has to be smaller than 1. Only then converges this thing to zero. And that's it. So this goes to zero and uh, thus we have now proven that our um, sequence of our iterative approximations is a Cauchy uh, sequence. And because it's a Cauchy sequence it converges and um, because it converges, there is a limit. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we should stop here. What is still to do next time? We have proven that our sequence converges. We have to prove now that it converges to a, um, a fixed point, to the fixed point. And we have to also to prove that this fixed point is unique, which is property one. Yeah? So, yeah. So we have now proven property, first part of property two. We have to prove that it converges to the fixed point and that there is a unique fixed point. That's what's still missing. Okay?